All right, I think it's about time. So welcome everyone to today's uh, Hercules School of Earth Sciences Colloquium talk. Today's speaker is Dr. Jacob Henley. He is a full professor at St. Mary's University, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. He is the principal researcher and manager of the mineral exploration and ore fluids laboratory at St. Mary's. His group's research focuses on the application of microanalytical techniques to understand ore deposit formations with a focus on precious metal deposits, PGE and gold in magmatic nickel, copper PGE, porphyry and orogenic gold settings, mainly in Canada. Dr. Henley received the 2016 Mineralogical Association of Canada Young Scientist Award. Other honors include the William Harvey Grass Medal from the Mineral Deposits Division of the Geological Association of Canada in 2011 and GAC or Howard Street Robinson Lecture in 2013. So before we start, I ask everyone to make sure that your microphones are muted during the talk and we will after the talk, you can ask your questions either by typing them in the chat box or you can turn on your microphone and ask your questions. So please go ahead, Dr. Henley. <clears throat> okay, uh, thanks very much um, for uh, the opportunity to talk. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge a few people at the start here. Uh, Corwin Trache and Jordan Burke uh, are really the uh, students that deserve the credit for what I'm showing you today. They undertook a, an enormous amount of uh, analytical work uh, uh, as well as field work to put together the story that uh, you're going to see today and also uh, many others who have contributed uh, from the point of view of analytical methods. Uh, Zoltan, who is now at the University of Geneva, uh, Ryan and Mustafa, Manitoba, uh, Eric, uh, Luke and Hendrik at uh, the geological surveys listed there respectively. So um, I'm gonna talk to you today about some research that we've been doing over the past um, five or six years on five element type veins. Um, Referring to uh, Steve Kisson's very nice summary of these deposits uh, in the ore geology um, um, or deposit models book, um, these deposit types are known to have several key characteristics, more or less universally. And I've listed those here. The first one being that they're uh, three to four stages of mineralization. They tend to start with, a, um, in some cases, not alls, with a uranium stage. Um, and then a, a, a common stage to all deposits is this uh, productive silver, sulfur arsenide, arsenide stage involving nickel and cobalt uh, and antimony as well. Uh, and then a base metal stage. Um, and then in many instances, a late uh, remobilization of silver and bismuth. The deposits occur uh, as zoned veins, breaches, space fillings. They tend to have very restricted alteration. Um, and they seem to not really care about host rock type. They utilize uh, boundaries between uh, lithologies, uh, areas of structural discontinuity. And there are two dominant models. Uh, Kisson's uh, summary uh, back in 1992 reviews many different models, but there seem to be two dominant models that prevail throughout the literature. One that invokes a, a primary magmatic hydrothermal association uh, of, the, of these uh, occurrences where metals and fluids are derived um, from uh, ma magmatic systems, magmatic rocks through that magmatic hydrothermal transition. And then another camp that focuses on the importance of conic waters, basinal fluids, um, black shales uh, as potential metal and fluid sources. <clears throat> The one outstanding thing that really, I think, got us interested in looking at these in more detail, and I think these are common uh, interests that many researchers have uh, in terms of these deposits, is that they tend to be showing outstanding examples of monomineralic veins They're with very minimal wall rock alteration and gang. Uh, and there are two examples here of slabs from styles of mineralization here in Canada. On the left is a is a about a two inch thick a nicoline vein uh, containing no uh, gang minerals at all aside from some minor quartz crystals growing along the margins. Uh, 
The wall rock on the right side there is a felsic um, uh, volcanic rock or uh, intrusive rock rather. Um, and aside from hematite staining and some minor albatization, uh, it's, it's quite fresh. The image on the right is from the Cobalt uh, Delganda camp and it's example where you have um, arsenide, sulfarsenide, silver vein with silver veinlets uh, splaying out to the margins, uh, cu cross-cutting sediments, Huronian age sediments. And so these are great examples to illustrate this point that uh, these are extremely high grade localized deposits that have minimal wall rock alteration aside from, uh, in some cases, negligible margins of chlorotization, uh, epitotization, and albatization, and often very little gain. Um, from the point of view of, of hydrothermal uh, mineral deposits, uh, this, this brings a, a challenge to uh, understanding how these form. It requires that we seek evidence for uh, uh, a mineralized system in which fluid to rock ratios are very low, or that the ore mineral content of those fluids are extremely high. Um, and the alternative uh, of fluid rock ratios being low or ore mineral content being uh, very high is, I think, in opposition to uh, some of the earlier models that have been raised for these. Um, so I'm going to talk about that later on, but I just want to point out uh, that dilemma because it's important to this story. So there was a a long period of research, um, many great studies done on these environments, not only in Canada, but in the US and Idaho and in uh, Europe, in systems in the, in the Schwarzwald, for example. And then quite a hiatus um, of uh, about 20 years with very little done uh, aside from research coming out of, of Morocco. And then in 2016 and 2017, uh, there were two papers published by uh, researchers in Germany um, that I think really took a, a new perspective, uh, looked at a, a new aspect of these from the point of view of mineral chemistry and paragenetic studies. Um, Gregor Markel and Matthias Burrish and their co-authors argued that these deposits require um, interaction of several different fluid phases, but that importantly, hydrocarbons may have played a role. Uh, and that that is an essential mixing process between hydrocarbons and metal bearing fluids uh, required to drop uh, metals out uh, pr uh, rapidly uh, to form these five element veins. So in terms of models and changes in the thinking about how these deposits form, this is probably the more recent uh, literature that you'll find and uh, a very important uh, new perspective. The deposits that we have studied over the last four or five years, uh, five years, are in the Northwest Territories. Um, there are occurrences, sub-economic occurrences of these styles of, of veins in the east arm of Great Slave Lake. And there are also larger systems that were economically significant for Canada in the past uh, in this area here in the Great Bear Lake Magmatic Zone. Um, we have looked at deposits or occurrences in both areas. And just to stress the importance of these historic deposits, um, these are very high tonnage, uh, sorry, very low tonnage, high grade systems. The, the El Dorado uh, system was about 2 million tons of ore, uh, but it yielded 30 million ounces of silver and about 15 million pounds of, of U308 um, over its history. And just for reference, the IOCG type system at NICO, uh, this 33 million ton cobalt, copper, gold, bismuth um, uh, deposit is here. Uh, and this I think is important to note because it stresses that um, as other deposit types in the area become developed, this opens the opportunity to um, you know, study these in more detail because uh, in particular, these ones here in the Great Bear Lake area are historic deposits and access is difficult because the deposits have, uh, have closed. Um, just an interesting tidbit of history. Um, the deposit at Port Radium, the El Dorado deposit, um, was mined in the 30s very briefly for the production of radium, uh, which had um, a rather sinister outcome in the end, but was very popular for a period of about three years um, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, 
Belgium, uh, the uh, Belgium bought all of the radium um, from the port radium deposit. Uh, and in 19, in the mid 1930s, radium was selling for about $80,000 US per gram. Uh, and the entire world supply came from that deposit. Um, and then later uranium uh, was mined in the 1940s um, and then silver uh, following that. Uh, the research that we did was based on field work in the Great Slave Lake area, um, but for the El Dorado deposit, uh, Corwin had to go to historical records as well as uh, a vast historical collection of samples collected in the 1930s uh, that resides at the Geological Survey of Canada um, in Ottawa. Um, and it was for him, just as a side, quite an interesting uh, exercise to have to go through historical records and to understand where in the context of the underground um, mining infrastructure at the El Dorado mine dating back to the 1930s where all of his samples came from. So that was the uh, map that he generated from the, the underground um, plan view uh, and uh, vertical sections that uh, came from the GSC collection. A general observation also with these systems, getting back to mineralogy and ore tenor, is that the mineral and metal association specifically and enrichments, relative enrichments, seem to be very consistent over very large areas. And this was, in addition to the lack of literature uh, in recent years, was the other thing that uh, I think got us interested in evaluating these, is that you can move from occurrence to occurrence and there's an enormous consistency uh, in huge areas uh, from one occurrence to the other uh, in terms of uh, metal endowment, which speaks to the idea that these are very large mineralizing systems uh, that have common fluid sources and metal sources. So we, we do a lot of fluid inclusion research and uh, both Corwin and Jordan uh, set out to uh, really pull apart the fluid inclusion systematics of uh, the El Dorado deposit and also uh, mineralized systems within the East Arm. Um, I don't have time in a talk of this length to go through all of the details of the fluid inclusion work, but the main message I want to uh, give you today is that the fluid inclusion data um, are based on uh, very careful textual work that uh, focuses on the, the fluid inclusion assemblage method, so trying to tie groups of fluid inclusions to specific uh, events uh, in, a, in, a, in a temporal context. Um, and in both systems, the fluid inclusion work focused on carbonates and quartz uh, as the primary host phases. And you can see a mosaic here of some of the detailed uh, petrographic features of these inclusions. And I'm gonna summarize this in a second. Um, this is the, the work from uh, Jordan Burke's uh, thesis in 2018. Um, and in both studies, the, the common data that came out of the fluid inclusion work uh, shows that there overwhelmingly is in all phases at all times a, a very high salinity brine that is very calcium rich. Uh, the calcium to sodium ratios of that brine are very high. But then later in the paragenesis, a second fluid joins uh, the fluid systematics, and that is a hydrocarbon phase. Um, in some instances, that hydrocarbon phase um, shows up in the fluid inclusion record as a gas, um, a mixture of, of methane and CO2. Um, but the earliest appearance of that in that fluid inclusion record is actually in the form of, of liquid hydrocarbons or solid bitumen particles. And there's some images here showing you in the lower right some of these uh, hydrocarbon phases um, in UV light uh, occurring in assemblages with, with an aqueous fluid. So this was quite remarkable to see this during the age of the rocks and their, their occurrence within crystalline, um, within crystalline basement. The fluid inclusion systematics, again, like the metal tenors, uh, are regionally very consistent from one, one system to another. You see relatively very little variation in salinity and homogenization temperature, uh, which again speaks to this idea that these are big systems um, um, for which uh, uh, they are sharing a common common fluid source with similar similar thermal characteristics uh, 
and salinity characteristics over a large area. So the fluid inclusion assemblage work combined with vein paragenesis, you can see in the, the upper left there, that very thick nicolene vein. And so this is just an example from Copper Pass, which is an occurrence in the East Arm of Great Slave Lake, showing you uh, the fluid inclusion characteristics within quartz crystals along the vein margins. Uh, and so combining that vein textural data, that paragenetic data with fluid inclusion systematics, uh, it comes up with this uh, very characteristic transition, again, from early brines and the appearance of, of oils and bitumens with the brine. Um, and then at the tail end, the hydrocarbons tend to shift to methane uh, plus or minus CO2. So that's the common, uh, common thread between the occurrences in the El Dorado and in the, the East Arm system. And this is not uncommon uh, to see this early brine phase within five element veins. Uh, this high calcium brine, it's, it's characteristic of uh, many deposits of this type worldwide. Um, but what is, what is new to the fluid inclusion record uh, is the occurrence of these hydrocarbons. And I'm going to focus on those in a few minutes. Um, just to talk a bit more about the occurrence of those hydrocarbons and bitumens, this is a really spectacular cathodoluminescence um, mosaic showing you the margin of that nicolene vein where you have a carbonate infill in the vein along with nicolene and safflorite, but those quartz crystals along the margin, a lot is happening in those. It's, it's, they're very important for this story because they're recording a transition from one fluid type to another, and they're also recording the appearance of that, that hydrocarbon phase. And so in this image, you can see the cathode luminescence response is quite dramatic. The quartz veins show um, multiple zones with uh, sectoral zoning as well as more regular uh, concentric zonation. And I just want to draw your attention to this very uh, blue and pink uh, fluorescent or luminescent zone right here. Those black specks you see are the, the bitumen inclusions in this case. Um, and then an enlargement of those um, in a BSC image on the scanning electron microscope is shown here, and you can see that they, they are zoned. Those tiny bitumen inclusions are zoned. They have cores that tend to be quite nickel and arsenic, and in the margins, they have uh, uranium um, in, this, in this case. So they're bitumens, but they're not just bitumens. They're metal-rich bitumens, and they are carrying um, the metal association that we find in five metal five element systems. Okay, so keep that, uh, that textural context in mind and we're gonna revisit it in a few minutes. Um, we looked at those hydrocarbons in more detail, um, not only the solid bitumen, but the oils. Uh, they are quite complex. Um, here are some Raman spectra showing you uh, some of the characteristics of those. They're, they're full of uh, a range of compounds with notable carriage peaks. Um, and also comparison of those bitumens to other uh, hydrocarbon environments show that, you know, they're very similar to solid hydrocarbons that have been observed in, in common, common settings like, uh, you know, the common thermally mature reservoirs in the offshore uh, bitumen within the Elliott Lake group in the Huronian uh, carry bitumen. It's the it's the same same characteristic compositions you see in, in the general sense. So the hydrocarbons show up in in several different phases, and now we need to go back and discuss the metal enrichment, as this is probably what everyone is most curious about. Um, this is a summary image showing you laser ablation ICPMS data uh, for brine inclusions from uh, these five element systems, as well as the bitumen. And there are some representative laser ablation ICPMS um, transient signals on the right there, uh, just, just to show you. Um, and what I've done is I've organized the major, minor, and trace elements along uh, here and the ore metals here. Uh, there are three really important things I wanna stress uh, based on our studies of hundreds of inclusions from 
from uh, the, the Great Slave Lake system. Uh, and that is that the brines have chemical characteristics that are very consistent with oil field brines uh, reported uh, in these two key studies here. So oil field MVT um, brines, uh, they, they have a similar composition. They are calcium rich. Um, they tend to carry this diagnostic assortment of elements. They have weight percent levels of potassium. Magnesium is very important. Uh, you don't see that commonly in a lot of fluid uh, inclusion studies. It's, it's not a common element to be showing up at concentrations of thousands of ppm. Uh, it does set um, these types of sedimentary brines aside from other fluids. Uh, and I'm going to come back to magnesium in a little while. Strontium very high, lots of lead, zinc, barium, manganese, rubidium, and cesium. Um, so that's point one. The second point is that the, the actual brines are surprisingly poor in metals. And not just where they occur coevally with the, the bitumen and, and other hydrocarbons, but on their own in discrete fractures, uh, in primary assemblages where they are not coevally trapped, with the hydrocarbons, the metals are very low in these um, across the board. It's rare to have any of the diagnostic ore metals within those brines um, higher than uh, a few ppm, actually. In contrast to that, and I think the third and most important point, and we saw this in the SEM image uh, one slide back, um, the SEM EDS analyses, is that the bitumens uh, are extremely rich in metals. Um, all of the diagnostic metals are present. Um, and not only that, but the concentrations are very, very high, uh, extending into the uh, hundreds to thousands of ppm. Um, and the enrichment in metals and bitumens is not, not uncommon. This is something that's been observed in other environments, for example, in the Athabasca Basin. In terms of the fluid chemistry, just to comment further on the brines, um, I think one of the, the more interesting outcomes of our fluid inclusion analysis is that we, we did do analyses of the halogens in the fluid inclusions uh, at Zoltan's lab. Um, and as you may be aware, uh, the halogen chemistry uh, in discrimination type diagrams like this involving chlorine, bromine, and sodium bromine uh, can give you an idea of whether, if you are dealing with sedimentary uh, fluids, um, whether you're dealing with fluids that have formed as a consequence of the evaporation of seawater, so bitterns, or fluids that form as a consequence of the dissolution of evaporites. Um, and that can be seen in the images here in the top left and bottom left. These are trajectories from seawater composition showing you the general trend that you would expect if fluids were dissolving seawater and the general trend you would expect if fluids um, precipitate halite. Halite uh, selectively pulls out um, uh, uh, chlorine. And so the, the resulting fluid, the bittern left behind, uh, becomes enriched in calcium and magnesium and other, other cations, but it also uh, loses its chlorine to bromine ratio starts to drop because it's preferentially losing chlorine. Um, and that can be seen in a couple of different diagrams here. And, and so what you see is that those brines, um, these, are, these are from the El Dorado deposit. They sit way down trajectory uh, over here. And they actually, in this compositional realm, would require uh, more than about 90% evaporation of seawater to get that far. So that's interesting. Um, the other thing is that um, when we look at the relative abundance of other cations in the fluids, we can recognize two different fluid types. Um, there are fluids that uh, tend to be more enriched in barium and strontium. Uh, and these are the ones that occur in the Great Slave Lake area where we can demonstrate that the re-equilibration and dissolution of feldspars in the wall rocks probably contributes to those cations. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, the fluids at El Dorado uh, overlap in their most extreme compositions with basinal brines, for example, from the Athabasca Basin and from MVT system have this 
uh, very significant endowment in magnesium. And so just based on metal grade and, so, and deposit size, as well as um, uh, relative depth, because we have depth constraints for both of these systems, um, right at the moment, we're working on looking at these discrimination diagrams more carefully to determine if you can use the fluid chemistry as a diagnostic tool to predict uh, where you are in one of these five element systems with the more prevalent sedimentary fluid end member dominating um, the, the shallower systems like at El Dorado and the crystalline basement dominated wall rock exchange brines uh, in the Great Slave Lake region as an example, um, dominating uh, this side of the diagram. So um, the key theme here is bitterns, extensive evaporation of seawater, and we'll come back to that in a second. In terms of the pressure temperature characteristics of the fluids, um, it is rare, but uh, on occasion you encounter an environment where you have the end member fluids um, in this case, a brine and a hydrocarbon phase trapped um, at, uh, at the same time in different fractures. So you've got fractures that are feeding two fluids into a vein. Um, and under the right circumstances, based on petrographic arguments, uh, you can use the methodology of intersecting isochores to determine exactly where in pressure temperature space um, those fluids were trapped. Uh, and we have that opportunity here because we have uh, trails of brine only, we have trails of hydrocarbon only, and we have trails um, where the hydrocarbons and the brines are trapped immiscibly. And you can see that here in frame D with these high variable um, um, phase proportion sizes in the inclusions. Um, this is a case where we have entrapment of the brine with that CO2 methane phase. And it's from those that we get our isochore data up above. Um, but also uh, down here, you see examples where you have um, hydrocarbons, liquid hydrocarbons trap the brines. So using the end member compositions, the brine and the, and the uh, CO2 methane inclusions, we've come up with uh, a window of, of entrapment for this emissibility assemblage uh, between about 150 and 200 degrees. Um, and quite low pressure, less than a kilobar. Um, this is data from the east arm of Great Slave Lake. Um, and just to point out that that's actually the window that we go through in temperature space uh, when oils are destroyed. So the intersection of that brine and carbonic fluid uh, isochores uh, are consistent with the PT conditions for the thermal degradation of, of, of heavier hydrocarbon phases. So another point to keep in mind. Um, in some of the inclusion assemblages that we have studied, we also see carbonates. And the carbonates are more prevalent in the inclusions with the higher CO2 to methane ratio. And so when we compare slightly earlier to slightly later assemblages, keeping track of that, that paragenetic or textural information that we get through fluid inclusion studies, um, we can demonstrate that as we're leaving the CH4 stable realm and into the CO2 stable realm, that carbonates are being precipitated through that process. And so it's reasonable then to conclude that the gang carbonates in these development veins are formed through the oxidation of those hydrocarbons. And in fact, if you compare the chemistry of those bitumens, our source for that carbon that goes into the carbonate, with the carbonates themselves. So this is a comparison of the rare earth systematics as an example. Uh, there are um, incredible consistencies between the two. And you can argue that the, the preservation or what you're seeing here is that the rare earth element pattern are inherited in that carbonate from the original bitumen that is burned out through interaction with that brine. So, so the fluid inclusion data um, coupled with uh, other constraints from trace element chemistry, uh, laser ablation uh, data, in addition to that original microthermometry and textual information that we obtained through this type of detailed study can be put together in terms of a, of a, of a tentative model. When you look at 
the different parts of these five element systems in terms of fluid source, um, metal source, the sink, the actual deposit locations, and the processes required to dump metals out of solution. Um, we've proposed, uh, and this is not a new model, it's something that has actually come out of the research done by the group working on the European deposits, uh, Matthias Burrish notably. Uh, but we've proposed that that type of model can also be adapted quite nicely to the five element systems here in Canada uh, in the Northwest Territories. And you'll hear more about that in an upcoming paper. But I just wanted to point out that we are trying to pin the results uh, to uh, proper constraints from the rocks. And I'm going to discuss just a few of those now for the remainder of the time we have. And by the way, um, there may be some of you out there concerned about uh, well, how do you how do you feed uh, brides and hydrocarbons down into crystalline rocks? This is uh, not, I think, really a, a problematic issue. Uh, there are studies not only uh, within basins here in Canada, but also globally, where uh, there's very uh, well documented uh, evidence uh, that oils and brines can migrate down into crystalline basement rocks quite efficiently, even through thick uh, packages of of, um, of sediment. Okay, so one of the aspects of the model that we need to uh, accommodate is this idea of mixing. We have fluid inclusion data, um, um, but the fluid inclusion data um, is just one line of evidence for mixing. And we see changes in fluid temperature, we see changes in fluid salinity um, with time. They're not big changes, but they are evident. Um, but what other type of information can we get from these samples as another layer of detail that we can put over top of that fluid inclusion information that helps support this idea um, that two fluids, a basement type fluid and a, a sedimentary brine, um, have been involved in the precipitation um, of these deposits. <clears throat> um, the, the, the data shown here are from SIMS oxygen isotope analyses done at the University of Manitoba. And this goes back to the same zoned quartz crystals in which we see the bitumen. Uh, and as you move from the cores of those crystals into the margins, specifically into this brightly colored blue <clears throat> and pink zone where the bitumen show up with brines coevally, uh, there's an enormous shift in the oxygen isotope composition of the quartz. And that's shown in this image where uh, Corwin went in and uh, defined different zones within the quartz and is plotted uh, here. There's 150 SIMS analyses. And what's evident is that the average and range in del O18, uh, sorry, delta O18 for the quartz, uh, it shifts by about 10 per mil on average with values up to 20 per mil from initial values as low as about uh, three per mil. And in those zones where we have the first appearance of that very metal rich bitumen, uh, that is where the values uh, reach their highest, highest levels. <clears throat> and the carbonates have compositions here that are infilling those veins, post dating the quartz. So the question is, is this a fluid mixing phenomenon or is it temperature phenomenon? Um, uh, it is a fluid mixing phenomenon because we know that fluid temperatures increase slightly with time um, and therefore the change in oxygen isotope composition of the quartz, um, it, it, it can't be related to changes in temperature. We would expect to see a shift to higher values if temperatures decreased with time, uh, but that's not the case. And so Really, the only way to accommodate this change is to consider that um, a, a significant incursion of some fluid uh, has taken and has mixed with an initially low delta O18 fluid. And the only fluids that you can really envisage doing this are basinal fluids that have formed uh, through equilibration with marine sediments because marine sediments inherit um, very high delta O18 values. Um, as they as they as they form uh, on the seafloor, so so there's a marine component that's supported not only in the fluid chemistry but also in the stable isotope systematics. 
Okay, um, so I've laid out a bunch of evidence for you and the evidence is pointing in the direction that the basinal brines, specifically brines produced through the evaporation of seawater have played a key role in the formation of these deposits. And that mixing of those uh, with a hydrocarbon phase uh, has been potentially responsible for metal deposition. Um, I want to shift gears now and talk a bit about the age of mineralization. And I want you to keep in mind the argument that we've made that there is a marine brine produced through evaporation and a hydrocarbon phase, because that's going to be critical in terms of interpreting uh, the geochronological data I'm going to present here. Originally, the, the El Dorado deposit age constraints, we'll just talk about El Dorado, okay? The El Dorado age constraints uh, came from cross-cutting relations. And those cross-cutting relations are summarized in this diagram here modified from Hamilton and Buchan. And the cross-cutting relationships dictate that the mineralization occurs between two intrusive events. And in the case of El Dorado, these intrusive events are the Cleaver Diabase, or 1740 MA, and the Western Channel Diabase. And the Western Channel Diabase actually cuts right through the El Dorado, El Dorado deposit. And in the original studies done by Kidd and Haycock and Jory, the mineralized structures are truncated by the Western Channel Diabase in those, in those articles. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's basically where the cross-cutting relationships come from. The uraninite ages that have been generated are all generally the same, uh, 1445, 1424, 1453, that's Gandhi et al, 2018. Um, but these have all been interpreted as resetting ages. And uh, many of you know there's uh, several events, but a, a, a big event that seems to show up um, uh, pervasively regionally, it shows up in the Athabasca Basin, uh, it, it shows up in many studied areas uh, where, where um, presumably some large-scale hydrothermal, regional hydrothermal and magmatic event around 1420, 1440 um, has potentially caused this resetting. So, so the urinate at ages are younger, but the cross-cutting relations based solely on this observation made in, the, in 1935 and in 1964 suggests that um, there's this window between the Western Channel and the Cleaver Dikes. Um, and that actually is quite well supported by other data. Um, the the Nair K volcanics and the Hornby Bay group um, were presumed to be a potential source of heat uh, to drive the hydrothermal circuitry related to the formation of El Dorado uh, based on uh, Rizika and Thorpe's work. They did model uh, lead lead ages that gave ages of 1625 for the base metal stage. Okay, so that's where we were, and now we need to talk about some of the problems with that model. Well, the biggest problem of all, independent of the new data that we've generated here, is that the fluid inclusions are very well preserved. Um, I showed you a mosaic of images from Corwin's thesis a little while ago. There we have, in the base metal stage, uh, we have fluid inclusions that are beautifully preserved in carbonates. These fluid inclusions homogenize at temperatures of 150, 180 degrees, and they are sitting adjacent to the Western Channel diabase, which cross cuts the deposit. You can see it here in gray. Um, and we can find these inclusion assemblages immediately adjacent to the Western Channel diabase. Um, you know, and you know, so the, the point is that there's no way that the Western Channel Diabase um, can truncate the mineralization. These inclusions would not have survived that. We would have had a, a, a contact metamorphic halo uh, locally. Uh, we don't see that um, in the fluid inclusion record. And so that's one red flag that I, I want to raise to you about the relative cross-cutting relationships um, that have been argued to be uh, as evidence for the age of mineralization predating the Western Channel Diabase. However, um, Corwin, when he was working on his project, he doubted this and went back to the original papers and read those descriptions more carefully. Uh, 
And the cross-cutting constraint is actually based on observations that structures that contain mineralization are cross-cut by the Western Channel Diabase. Not that the mineralization is cut. And that's an important distinction to make. So uh, fluid inclusion evidence suggests that these fluid inclusions in the base metal stage of this protracted paragenesis for the El Dorado deposit formed after the Western Channel Diabase. So that's one point. Second point is, do we have anything we can date that hasn't been reset, right? And so going back to the thin sections, uh, Corwin identified or, uh, or defined that the uraninite stage and the arsenide stage were not dis that distinct. There's overlap between the two of them. And you can see evidence for that in the top images here where we have coliform banded uraninite um, and we have tiny crystals, uh, dendrites of, of sulfur arsenides and arsenides occurring within zones, suggesting that there were periods where we were entering the precipitation window for arsenides and then leaving that window and then re-entering that window as uraninite was being precipitated. And we see that in other examples here in the bottom where we have zoned crustiform and coliform arsenides and sulfur, sulfur arsenides with periodic episodes of minor uraninite deposition. And it is in that association you see there where we have a growth band of uraninite where the mineral xenotime appears as an accessory mineral. <clears throat> uh, so here's the paragenesis that Corwin produced, and there's the xenotime occurring within the arsenide stage. They're actually two different variants, one slightly earlier than the other. Um, Corwin went to Ottawa and he was with Bill Davis and obtained shrimp uh, 207, 206 ages uh, for the xenotime, and those yield an age of 1442 plus or minus 36 M8. So this is interpreted to be a primary crystallization age of the xenotime. It's occurring within the growth banding, the coliform growth banding or crustiform coliform growth banding within the arsenides and sulfur arsenides. And this is well below the closure temperature, which we estimate to be around 600 degrees C for 10 micron grains. So the, the point here is that we have a new constraint on the age of the arsenide mineralization, which is one of several stages in this paragenesis, which suggests that the 1442 is not a resetting. It's actually a primary mineralization age for one stage of this complex paragenesis. So what is happening at this window with the error that he comes up with in a xenotime, this window between 1400 and 1480. For that, we have to look at the intracrotonic basins um, in the area and specifically the Hornby Bay Basin. But I'm gonna show you stratigraphic summary of all of the basins here compiled by Rainbird et al. Um, and so we have a, a constraint uh, between say 1414 1480 with our uncertainty. And we also know that at that time, if we're precipitating arsenides and uranium and silver, that the fluids present at that time have to be able to provide us with this metal association or the hydrocarbons at that time have to be able to provide us with that metal association. And that the fluids are evaporitic brines. They're formed the evaporation of seawater. And this comes now full circle because the, the only sections of the stratigraphic sequence through these intercrotonic basins that can be relevant to those metal, those hydrocarbon and fluid origins are the uppermost parts of the sequences. And I'll draw your attention to the Dismal Lakes group in the Hornby Bay Basin, where not only is there evidence of evaporitic and evaporites, but also black shales. We do not have any data for metals for those black shales, but we're going to be working on that. However, we know that in these types of basins, the appearance of hydrocarbons is associated with anomalies in these characteristic metals. And I'm showing you 
some bitumen data from the Athabasca Basin in the lower left corner compared to the bitumens from Copper Pass in the east arm of Great Slave Lake. And so the metal associations are there and the concentrations are quite high. Um, and so the point of all of this is to illustrate to you that we have um, good constraints on the fluid chemistry that require the presence of an evaporite sequence that require black shales um, to supply the metals to those basement rocks. And we also have an age constraint, which is consistent with that from the xenotime, suggesting that those resetting ages for uraninite may actually be the primary ages originally considered back in the 1970s. Um, yeah, and I'm just pointing out that that 1.4-ish billion year event of post-or resetting shows up everywhere. And so, you know, maybe that is the event driving the formation of these um, five element veins regionally. Um, and they show up in many different locations, right, within these um, settings. So it's, it's, it's not isolated to just the, the Great Slave Lake environment. Is this something much bigger? And is this the primary hydrothermal um, uh, event, the timing associated with the development of these incredibly rich veins. We see that same age <clears throat> showing up elsewhere. This is data from the Blatchford Lake Intrusive Suite where polymetallic veins have cross-cut gabbros and have actually replaced magnetites with rutile and anchorite. And we have, um, albeit with a large error, we have age data it's the only constraint we have from Great Slave Lake, but it's age data for that environment as well. And it, it also shows this, uh, this window occurring around 1400 uh, MA, but uh, albeit with quite a big error. So these systems appear to show the same primary age constraints uh, in multiple areas. So to summarize, the five element veins plus minus uranium in the Northwest Territories uh, we're arguing have formed uh, through the interaction of heated evaporitic brines um, and metal rich hydrocarbons and that the oxidation and the thermal degradation of those hydrocarbons has been key to producing these, these uh, very rich polymetallic veins. We now have direct evidence from fluid inclusion record for the theoretical models um, that, that Markle and uh, Matthias Burrish have proposed. Uh, that require a hydrocarbon component uh, to mix with metal rich fluids for rapid precipitation of these metals. Um, and in order to supply those metals and those fluids, we need intracrotonic basins. It can't be done uh, solely with basement fluids. The basement fluids may be important. Um, uh, in some way, we haven't resolved that exactly, but uh, what, what's coming down and mixing are are basinal fluids. These are not uh, these are not fluids that are being solely derived from um, intrusive systems in 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 the, in the basement rocks. Uh, and does the proximity of the deposit um, does the proximity of structural preparation of the deposit to that sedimentary fluid and metal source have something to do with the size and grade? And we're looking carefully at the fluid chemistry. Um, um, in different parts of these systems at different depths relative to where the interpreted unconformity would have been <clears throat> to see if uh, there is some spatial relationship between the proximity to that sedimentary um, basin uh, and the actual fluid and metal chemistry. There are many outstanding questions. Uh, what heat sources were required uh, to drive that, uh, to, to heat that fluid? What regional tectonic events triggered ore formation? And why is it that uranium only shows up in some systems? Is this because there are locally proto-ore sources for uranium in the basement rocks, or is it differences in the basin uranium supply? Okay, so that's everything. I have some additional slides um, that are probably gonna be relevant to questions, so I'll, I'll wait and see what comes. Perfect, thanks a lot, Dr. Henley. So the floor is open for any questions. You can either type in the chat box or you just turn on your microphone and ask your question. Yeah, I've got a question. It's Alan King. 
Hey, that was really great. Uh, I've been wondering about these for a while. Um, what do you think of the relationship to the Athabasca and conformity type deposits? Um, there's not a lot of data available for accessory metals within uh, the, the Athabasca Basin deposits. Much of that data actually comes from the mineral processing side. And there were several abstracts um, that have come out over the last five year window at various conferences talking about um, the byproduct and, and, and slime metals from uh, uranium production. Um, and the, the five element association is, is certainly pervasive through those studies. So from the point of view of metal supply, uh, certainly the, the unconformity uranium um, has endowments, uh, trace element endowments that are relevant. But the issue is that um, we, in this particular case, we don't have um, well-characterized unconformity uranium systems in the most relevant basin, Hornby Bay, properly characterized to make those arguments yet. But the certainly the uh, in our bitumen, uh, as well as the overall trace element metal endowments, uh, relative metal endowments uh, of bitumen from uh, the Uraniferous basins and the five element systems appear to be coincident. So it would be, it's an interesting connection to try to make, but uh, I don't know what that connection is. And because there's the egress and the ingress models, which separate yeah. the uranium into two, and they're they're very variably similar, so it's it's a yeah. you know, it's an interesting area. Yeah, and the the fluids. The one thing a, a, a common thread there that I think is worth pursuing is that the fluid chemistries are remarkably similar. Um, in in uh, in the plot that I showed you there uh, with the, the magnesium barium strontium, the, the relative fluid chemistries. Uh, those fluids are from the, the Rabbit Lake, from some of the uh, quartz carbonate veins in the foot wall of the Rabbit Lake mine. So um, certainly, you know, the fluid chemistries are very similar. Uh, but to make the connection in terms of, uh, I think there's a lot more data needed in terms of trace element uh, uh, chemistry. Some of the accessory metal chemistry is, is it's really missing from the um, from the, uh, the the database, and we need to we need to bother the the metallurgists more in the uranium business to find out exactly what those relative enrichment patterns are and start making real comparisons. Yeah, the uh, just uh, you know it, they're, they're they're quite similar to the ingress model, I think. And somebody's pointed out that that requires extension tectonics, which relates to maybe a thermal event, and that mm -hmm. that might help explain how it gets into the basement. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. Right. Um, I see a question from Sean Hex. Sean, do you have your microphone? You can turn on your microphone and ask, or you want me to read it? Well, I, I read the question. Do the do the cobalt Goganda style five element vein systems also have these metallic hydrocarbons, or is that what is separating these? deposit types. Um, okay, uh, we'll just pull this up here, and make it easier to, to talk about it. Okay, so we haven't looked at cobalt Galganda yet, uh, but I do plan to do that. Um, I'm a bit of a cobalt Galganda file. I have a one of the largest collections of ore samples from this environment uh, in the world. And so I have lots of burial to look at. And I've been very careful to select samples from different stages within the mineralization there. And um, all I'd be willing to say at the moment is that one of the general characteristics, in addition to your ur uranium endowment in basins, is that these basins commonly have a silver endowment um, underneath them in, in the crystalline rocks. It's not the case in the Athabasca Basin. There's been no discoveries made to my knowledge, but certainly Hornby Bay, uh, this image is showing you the, this, the intracratonic basins here on the northwest shore of Lake Superior, where you have the silver islet and the Thunder Bay deposits, and also cobalt is here. 
So it's a big question. We haven't resolved that. We haven't started working on it. I will point out two important things that I want to stress. One is that the, the base and O'Brien chemistry in the fluid inclusions at cobalt, um, at least from what has been published, is very similar. They're high calcium fluids, but we really need to analyze those for trace elements uh, and halogens to be able to pin down their origin. Um, and the salinities are so high that they would only be they they would only be achievable through evaporite dissolution. So um, you don't produce fluids of that salinity from magmas. It's impossible. No, no magmas are uh, rich enough in chlorine uh, or having high enough chlorine to water ratios to generate fluids like that. And the second point I want to make about cobalt is that the nipissing diabase. Uh, is most certainly relevant as a heat source, but there are a lot of serious problems when you try to associate it with metal as a, as a metal source. The metal association uh, to associate uh, arsenic silver, uh, uh, for example, with a, with an, uh, with a, with a diabase, a basaltic composition, it would be, I think, quite a stretch. Um, and the ores are very iron and sulfur poor at cobalt in the arsenide stage. And there's also a mass balance uh, problem. Um, uh, we, we don't see silver deposits uh, occurring everywhere where the Nipissing diabase occurs in the Canadian Shield cross-cutting Huronian rocks, right? So there, there's something else missing there. And I would argue that it's, it's tied to potentially the chemistry of the younger sediments that that need to be properly resolved in the context of the Huronian age rocks. And we see the same textures. This is a sample from my own collection here showing you um, where we've dissolved carbonate out. There are these quartz crystals along the margins. And so this is the first place we're going to look for uh, hydrocarbons uh, to see if we see the same temporal and textural relationships um, that we see in other deposits at, uh, say, uh, El Dorado and, and Great Slate Lake. So certainly there's lots of material available, uh, but there are some serious concerns, I think, uh, with the models that we need to rationalize with uh, more recent. And so cobalt really needs a concerted effort to better understand. OK, any other questions? You can just turn on your microphone. Yes, I would like to uh, ask a question. My name is Luis Corriveau. Go ahead. Uh, well, Jacob, um, your study area uh, are all part from uh, mineral systems that have OCG and affiliated deposits. They all have plenty of metals uh, with cobalt, nickel, gold, the silver and everything you've mentioned in your five element things. And those systems are extremely well known to be, uh, to have their metal remobilized extremely easily. So could the systems themselves be the metal source? And then your fluid uh, with the bitumen coming from the overlying sedimentary uh, basin. So, which means that the beauty of if that was the case, then is that if you have five element veins, then that might be a vector for OCG mm. and affiliated deposits. So that that's a connection I have thought about. Um, and of course, admittedly, you are uh, one of our Canadian experts on IOCG, so it would be worth further discussion. I will point out the one concern I have with remobilizing metals from IOCG systems is that it would have to be a very unusual and selective remobilization because at the conditions that nickel and cobalt and arsenic are soluble um, by any ligand um, at hydrothermal conditions, um, copper iron are orders of magnitude more soluble. And so I don't have a problem with remobilizing metals from pre-existing deposits. I like that idea because it, it is a, it's, you have a means of, you have a pre-concentration, which is the, the, the thing you need. 
but I, I struggle with the aqueous geochemistry there. Um, and it's, it's the same argument that comes up in magmatic nickel copper PG systems about um, hydrothermal PGEs is that, you know, at the conditions that PGEs are, are sorry, that copper, sorry, that PGEs are really soluble, the base metals are orders of magnitude more soluble. So if it is a possibility, it would require some thought about ligands that are selectively good at moving nickel cobalt. And I will point out something interesting that the one ligand that no one ever talks about that is the most efficient at moving nickel and cobalt is, is um, carbonyl. And in fact, the, the mechanism you extract nickel sorry, from... Sorry, uh, I miss uh, with my French. What is the, the car uh, carbon? Carbonyl, yeah, so CO and, and also, uh, and, and also car carbon dioxide. Sorry. These are used to extract nickel uh, from, from ores in mineral processing. Uh, it, it's an, it's so I, I, I struggle with the geochemistry. I think it's possible, but we would have to come up with an argument why the metal and, and association is so sulfur, copper and iron poor. If you're, you're sourcing the metals from very copper and iron rich proto ores as IOCG. So. I like the idea a lot, but I struggle with the geochemistry. But the beauty is the, like if we think of the, the bismuth collector model, the mm -hmm. bismuth will like, will love the gold, but it doesn't care much about the copper and all the other metals. Mm -hmm. Well, then your bitumen could be the same thing. It could carry some metals, but not the others. Yeah. And I find that uh, uh, well, when we map those systems, and I've mapped at El Dorado with Hamid Mamun, and, and mm -hmm. we can see that each time that you have a slightly new event, then uh, you're forming veins. Uh, we've mm -hmm. dated veins at the Nico deposit. Uh, some of them are quartz carbonate uh, with uh, calcopyrite, and, and, and then they will be at 1850 while we know this, the deposit is at 1870. Uh, so, mm. so really, each time something's happening to those systems, they are so, so, so unstable that metals will be remobilized. Mm. Mm. So I think that's something that should be kept in mind. Uh, mm. I'm an original field geologist, so for me, the five element veins, people are so attracted to veins Mm -hmm. And in the Great Bear, you would be in a mineralized breccia, but only the quartz veins were sample. So mm -hmm. people would not, they would totally channel, do a channel across the quartz veins and stop within the mineralized mm -hmm. breccia and not mm -hmm. even notice they were in the mineralized OCG type breccia. So mm -hmm. it's very important to stress the the potential linkages so that each time we have five element veins that are easy to, uh, uh, very easy to identify and very easy uh, to sample and attract the AIs. Mm -hmm. And we should think about the host rock. And uh, so I, yeah. I find your work very fascinating, but I like to look at the whole mineral system because it's so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, the process you're talking about uh, really will help us uh, expand uh, our exploration for critical metals across yeah. Canada. So thank you very much for this great talk. Yeah, I do think it's important that we we try to really make headway on as many different end members of possible even if they're remobilizations that post-state mineralization by 300 million years, which would have to be the case for this example you're bringing up. Um, I, I don't think we, we really focus enough on uh, except of proto, you know, constant pre-concentration. So I appreciate that comment very much. Right, there's a question from Manuel Scherer here. It says, what do you think the precipitation mechanism is? The reduction model by Markle only works if at least the arsenic is transported by the basinal fluid. Uh, 
mm -hmm. which is in turn reduced. If arsenic is transported by the hydrocarbon fluid, as you have shown, mm -hmm. reduction is not a viable option. Yep, that's a good question. Um, I didn't go into the fluid chemistry in enough detail, but one of the things we do notice is that in the fluid inclusion assemblages that are sin to post mineralization, they still carry a substantial arsenic component. Arsenic is not very rich in the fluids at all, but where it is present, the other metals drop out completely, like they're, they're completely absent by the end. You might go from a few ppm or tens of ppm um, uh, silver to nothing, but the arsenic stays more or less constant. And so I am wondering if that is tied to what uh, um, Gregor and, and Matthias have been discussing in terms of the, the uh, having, having more than one um, um, arsenic valence stage in solution. So it's a good question, but I, I don't think I'm in a position to answer it until we undertake modeling with the mineralogical strains, constraints we have. Um, Hi, Jacob. It's Stephanie from Manitoba. I Hi. have <laughs> excellent talk and you uh, touched already some of the questions I have. And it goes similar to what Manuel just asked and as well as Luis. If you assume that the hydrocarbons um, transported most of the metals, what I know it's more hypothetical, but what do you think? How was the metal transport? Was it just an absorption process or the, to the hydrocarbons or were they transported yeah. in kind of a complex? And if that was the case, what kind of complex would it be? I, I, I'm not keen on the idea of complexes because even in, um, even in a hot, in, like if we, if we use oils, uh, you know, liquid hydrocarbons from like just oil producing areas as a, as a, as a comparison. Um, the concentrations of metals of specific metals can be quite high, but they're never that high. Uh, in other words, I, I like more the idea that if you were to look at those hydrocarbon droplets um, and analyze those uh, using, for example, um, wide angle beam line, uh, wide angle beam line, X-ray diffraction beam line on synchrotron, you may actually see that there are colloids, there are particles. So to get to these extreme numbers we see in our bitumens and also to, to explain why the metal concentration ranges are so variable in the bitumens from one assemblage to another, and even within assemblages, the numbers jump all over the place. I like the idea more that rather than being carried as a complex, that they are present as particles um, um, adhering to the bitumen or particles suspended in the bitumen. Uh, but I have no evidence for that. I'm just pointing out that we need, we need uh, you know, even with a conventional oil carrying a few tens of ppm um, of, of these metals, uh, it, 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 you would have to have a huge amount of it to supply the metal to these systems. So we really need a big punch and therefore we need, um, we need some kind of a colloid or a solid phase that's being transported, but adhering to that bitumen. So it's like a collector, um, but I, I don't think it's a soluble, I, I would, I would have, a, I would be willing to put money on it not being soluble, but I have no evidence for that. It's just my, my gut feeling. <laughs> Thanks. Um, is there any final questions anybody wants to ask? All right. If, if not, so thank, thanks, Dr. Henley, for a very interesting talk. And thanks, everyone, for joining this talk. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.